One important turning point in Ursula K. Le Guin's fourth Earthsea novel, Tahanu, is when Ged, the former Ark Mage, going not only by his name Sparrowhawk, but also just as Hawk, reappears. And we should remind ourselves, why is this so centrally important? Well, in early on in the novel, in the fourth chapter, Ged is dropped off, completely drained of power, near death, by the great dragon Kalesin. Tenar takes him in and with the help <coughs> of Auntie Moss, nurses him back to health. He is emptied of power, filled with fear, and you could say shame and humiliation, as he'll talk about a little bit later, and can't face the young king who has sent envoys out looking for him on, on Gaunt. And so he flees. He doesn't just head south. He flees to the south to herd goats. At first he was going to go north, and Tenar says, that's a bad idea. You know, cutting hay, you're an old man. This would be rough work. At least become a shepherd or something. Auntie Moss sends him on his way with some uh, victuals, some, some bread and some, some uh, cheese and meat, and he, he's gone. And so he's out of the picture for a while, except in the memories of Tenar. And the story proceeds. Tenar ends up going back down to the farm, and she's there with Theru and all of the other people involved with the farm. And then something happens. The people who were involved with the horrific abuse that Theru, the young burned child, had endured, Handy and the two other men come at night to try to break in, to take the child back and to punish both her and her adoptive mother, Tenar. And in the, in the struggle, what we find is, um, you know, they're, they're banging on the shutters. They say, let us in. We won't hurt you. We just want to talk to you. He just wants to see his little girl. You know, let us in and we won't hurt you. And Tenar knows that they, they will try to hurt her. Then suddenly there's a, a noise, a howl and a sucking gasp. And a man yelled, look out. Another shouted, here, here. Then there was silence. Light from the open doorway shot across the black ice of puddles, glittered on the black branches of the oaks and on fallen silver leaves. And as her eyes cleared, she saw that something was crawling towards her on the path, a dark mass or heap crawling towards her, making a high sobbing wail. Behind the light, a black shape ran and darted in long blades shone. Tenar, stop there, she said, raising the knife. Tenar, it's me, Sparrowhawk, Hawk, stay there, she said. And she looks at him and sees him with a long tined pitchfork like a wizard's staff. Is that you, she said. He was kneeling now by the black thing on the path. I killed him, I think, he said. He looked up over his shoulder and stood up. There was no sign or sound of the other men. And as it is, Ged hasn't actually killed him. He stabbed him with a pitchfork. This is one of the, the people who was going to do harm to Theru and to, to Tenar. Um, and it, it glanced off of one of his ribs, but did him some considerable damage. They bring him in, and eventually they will turn him over to the witch Ivy, who will bind him and heal him. Why? Because he's going to hang. He's going to hang or be condemned to a galley. And so after these, these three men are attacking, Ged is the hero who, in some respects, saves the day, right? Tenar is not completely without resources. She has a knife. She's trying to resist, but she probably would have been beaten. And it turns out that Ged ran across these men. He says um, that, that he heard them talking on the way, and he followed them down. So he's, he's essentially saved Tenar and Thero from a horrible fate, whatever these men were about to do to them. Ged is going to stay the night with Tenar, just in case the men come back. He's also, you know, almost frozen stiff. It's winter. And they, they catch up a bit over time. So that's an important thing. And, you know, there's no question of him being able to stay in part because uh, everybody recognizes that if he had not been there, a catastrophe would have happened and evil would have been done. 
Now, after that, their relationship is going to, you could say change, but we might actually say instead, not change, but ripen, come into its fulfillment. And we need to remind ourselves who these people are. Ged was the young wizard, the mage, who went into the tombs of Atawan seeking the lost half of the ring of Erith Akba. When he had the other ring, Tenar was the lone priestess, the, art, the high priestess of the tomb. Uh, the, the nameless ones were her masters, and she and Gad come to know each other within the labyrinth where she has him trapped. And then... They make their escape together after reforming the ring. She leaves Atuan, leaving behind her culture, her role, her power, everything about herself, coming with Ged first to uh, present the ring at the Isle of Havnor in the center of the world, and then coming back to Gaunt and becoming the pupil of Ged's former teacher, Ogion, until she decides to to change that for becoming a farmer's wife and raising children and managing a farm. It's a long time for both of them that they've been involved with each other. Ged recognizes, even back in the tombs of Atuan, the beauty and the resiliency and the power and the capacity of Tenor. She's an unusual person. She, of course, recognizes him and she thinks to herself several times earlier on in the story why did we never become involved and the answer is well he's a mage he can't become involved they're celibate why did we never even consider that now that's going to change emptied of his power coming back as not quite a triumphant hero but certainly the guy who saved the day for the people that he loves Ged and Tenar can now change their relationship. It can become romantic. It can become sexual. And she says to him, which bed shall I sleep in, Ged, the child's or yours? He drew breath. He spoke low. Mine, if you will. I will. The silence held him. She could see the effort he made to break from it. If you'll be patient with me, he said. Remember, too, this is an old man who has never had sex. He has been a virgin this entire time. Uh, he's essentially, you know, like a, as, as, as Auntie Moss has pointed out, like a 15-year-old boy, uh, the boy who went off to Roke. And then she says, this is a very beautiful passage, I've been patient with you for 25 years. She looked at him and began to laugh. Come, come on, my dear, better late than never. I'm only an old woman. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is ever wasted. You taught me that. She stood up and he stood. She put out her hands and he took them. They embraced and their embrace became close. They held each other so fiercely, so dearly that they stopped knowing anything but each other. It did not matter what bed they meant to sleep, to sleep in. They lay that night on the hearthstones. And there, and there's a beautiful line, she taught Ged the mystery that the wisest man could not teach him. And this is great Le Guin writing, you know, so, something that so many people have known, love, tenderness, having sex the intimacy that comes with it, something that people have experienced throughout millennia. And it's, it's not something that you know, costs you anything other than commitment in, in this case, right? And in so many other cases. And yet it's not something that the, the wise mages can actually teach him anything about because they haven't experienced it and don't think about it for the most part. And this goes on. There's a tenderness between them that Le Guin is very good at depicting. They woke again at dawn. A faint silvery light lay on the dark, half-leafless branches of the oaks outside the window. Tenor stretched out full length to feel his warmth against her. After a while, he murmured. He was lying here, hake, right under us. Ged made a small noise of protest. Now you're a man indeed, she said. Stuck another man full of holes first and laying with a woman second. That's the proper order, I suppose. Hush, he murmured, laying his head on her shoulder. Don't. And then they, they you know, there's a little bit more talking uh, between them. Then they lay in warmth and sweet silence. 
And there's a lot of this going on through um, the story. It, it, this vignette ends here. He raised himself up on one elbow so he could look at her face. His own face was so open and vulnerable in its ease and fulfillment and tenderness that she had to reach up and touch his mouth there where she had kissed it months ago, which led to his taking her into his arms again. And the conversation was not continued in words. So they now have this possibility of fulfillment of, as people called it back in the day, conjugal love. There are some formalities to get through. Um, Ged cannot just immediately become, you know, her lover and have that ratified by everybody just, you know, nodding their heads. Instead, she, she's got to make a case for why he's going to be um, a central part of the farm. The chief of the formalities was to tell Clearbrook and the other tenants she'd replace the old master with a hired hand. She did so promptly and bluntly. They could not do anything about it, nor did it entail any threat to, to them. A widow's tenure of her husband's property was contingent on there being no male heir or claimant. Um, going on a little bit further, to her relief, they made no objections at all. Hawk had won their approval with one jab of a pitchfork. Besides, it was only good sense in a woman to want a man to protect her. If she took him into her bed, well, the appetites of widows were proverbial, and after all, she was a foreigner. The attitude of the villagers was much the same, a bit of whispering and sniggering, but little more. It seemed that being respectable was easier than Moss thought, or perhaps that used goods had little value. So... Ged and Tenor are now accepted as a couple. She is still holding the farm. Ultimately, her son will show up, and they will, in fact, leave the farm to him. Um, but they, they're going to assume their roles in relation to each other as life partners, these two very unusual people. They will have rather intellectual but also practical conversations. They will face the future together and they will move on into their life with tenderness. So Ged really does come home, come back to Tenar in a way that brings these matters to a successful close. He wards off the danger that has been threatening them. Ultimately, of course, they're going to fall into another danger from which they will both need to be saved uh, by Theru, um, who, by the way, Ged takes on as his own daughter as he takes on this new relationship with Tenar. So this is the fulfillment of Ged in a way that kind of echoes the ending of a wizard of Earthsea, except now it's not him by himself. It's Ged coming home to Tenar and to Theru and beginning a new life together. 